My husband doesn't believe in mental illness. Uh, my ACEs score is a nine. Whoa! Oh, you could do probably like an entire series <laughs> just on my life. Your husband actually sounds like a nice, he's a nice guy. He's amazing. Okay, and he's an idiot. And those two things can be true at the same time. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, whatever's going on in your world. I'm so glad that you've joined us on the Dr. John Deloney Show. I'm John, and we are here for one reason. To help you have a better life, better marriage, help you get along with your kids a little bit better, help you figure out what's going on in this wackadoo world. And get some questions, some honest answers about your mental health and what's going on. Whatever's going on in your life, we're here to help. And I'm so grateful that you've joined us. And I, I just, I'm, I'm becoming overwhelmed by the countless letters and notes and direct messages, all just the positive things people are doing to change their life, little bitty things here and there, picking up from the show. So thank you so much for being with us. I'm so grateful. Um, if you want to be on the show, give me a buzz, 1-844-693-3291. And it makes all the difference in the world. Super weird, but it makes all the difference in the world if you will just hit the subscribe button. Um, on, if you listen to this on Apple podcast or Spotify podcast, if you will subscribe to the show, YouTube, subscribe to the show, um, leave great killer five-star reviews. All that stuff helps so much, helps all across the board, um, helps put this show in front of people who have never heard of it, whose marriages are falling apart, whose kids are bonkers, who are struggling with depression, anxiety, whatever. And they'll, they would never have known about the show otherwise. And we got it in front of them just because you took it one second to hit subscribe. So Thank you so, so much to everybody who's doing that. It means the world. Let's go out to uh, Sadie in Yorktown. Sadie, what's up, Sadie? Hello. How we doing? I'm good. How are you? We are rocking on to the break of dawn, Sadie. Having a party. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. What's up? Um. So, first of all, thank you for taking my call. Of course. Um. I've had a pretty hard year. Um, and your podcast and your show has, I watch it every day and it's giving me some awesome tips for dealing with my childhood trauma and some things I struggle with. Um, and so I had a question for you that I think you can help me with. Well, first of all, I'm sorry you've had a bum year and the <laughs> cool thing Thank is you. we got nine more months to go so we can turn this ship around. Right. And, uh, thanks for being with us, man. It means, it means the world to me. Thank you. So let's, let's uh, figure it out. Let's do it. What's up? Okay, so my question is, my husband doesn't believe in mental illness. Um, I have been clinically diagnosed with OCD and ADHD. Welcome to the um, gang. Yeah. I know that I'm unmedicated for. So, um, yeah, trying to navigate that. Um, I was diagnosed as an adult after I had my children. Um, and I've also suffered through bouts of depression. Um, yep. How do I get him to understand these are very real for me and affect my day-to-day -day life. Um, even if I'm in agreement that I don't, not that I don't believe in mental illness, I don't think I'm broken. Um, a little bit of background, uh, my ACEs score is a nine. Whoa! Um, <laughs> yeah. So a uh, lot on, of childhood on. trauma. A nine? A nine. God. Yes, sir. God almighty. Um, my husband is a zero. Um, oh, and we've been together geez. since we were 15 and 17. So I think there's been some times for him where he's seen me as what he would think in his mind is quote unquote normal. Um, and now I'm 29 and a lot of this stuff is resurfacing. Um, part of my bummy year is I lost my dad unexpectedly last June. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, he had been an addict my entire life, um, and got clean 10 years ago. Went back to college, um, got a degree in addictions counseling, started a program here in our hometown where he helped hundreds of families, um, and he passed away in June from a accidental fentanyl poisoning. Oh, man. So, Did he have a relapse? Um, I'm, yes. Yeah. And at first, it's been sort of trudging through all of that, the being in denial at first. And now it's been about nine months and it's saying, yeah, we're looking back at all of this and yeah. he had relapsed and it's heartbreaking because I think he felt like he was the strong person leading everybody and he's died. And what's happened is a lot of my own trauma has resurfaced and of affected course. me, but I'm also seeing a lot of him and me. Yeah. And, and being uh, how old are your kids? Person. 
Um, they are two and four. Yeah. And you, I would expect, and I don't say this to freak you out. I say this just, just, just to be ready. Um, as your body begins to remember those moments, as your kids hit those milestones, expect yep. your, your body to try to solve that again. Cause it missed out the first yep. time around. And it's going to try to solve it again. Now that you're, you're taller and you have bigger muscles, right? Yep. Yep. And that's what I tell my husband is Dr. John always says like the body doesn't forget. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Especially not with a nine. Um, yeah. Whew, there's so, so much here. Um, Oh, you could do probably like an entire series <laughs> just on my life. <laughs> well, here's the thing. So, um, your husband actually sounds like a nice, he's a nice guy. He's amazing. Okay. And he's, he's an idiot. And those friend. two yeah. things can be true at the same oh, yeah. time. Right. Okay. Good. Yeah. Yeah. And tell him that I said that. That's fine. Tell him he sounds wonderful and he's a moron. The second thing he is. Would, he would agree. Yeah, right. The second thing is two things can be true at the same time. Um, yeah. That your dad was absolutely in no shape form or fashion the dad that he should have been for you. Mm-hmm. And that guy loved you through the, the foggy lens of addiction. Yeah. Right? He loved his baby girl. Yeah, and that's something that I didn't realize until he passed away. And that's, that's right. hard you- because there's unresolved there. That's right. And you'll and never be able to have the conversations. That's right. You can't. You can't. Yes. And so one of the devastating moments of grief is being able to have those conversations with the ether. Yeah. And even if you'd had him, you know this, Sadie, he wouldn't have heard him. Right? Yeah. And no. so all that to say is both of those things are true at the same time. Here's something else that's true. OCD and ADHD are very, very real. And... Yeah they can't be the excuse by which our life, the, the, the lives of those who love us and interact with us that we've chosen to be in relationship with have to suffer. Mm-hmm. Both of those are true also. Okay. So what you're, yeah. you're, you're holding this paradox and it's, it's messy. And those who love people who struggle with addiction, those who struggle with mental health challenges, those who are married to amazing people whose lives were pretty greased, um, moving forward, pretty, pretty straightforward lives. Um, the, the, Paradox, the two sides of that barbell are just the weight is really heavy. Yeah. Is that fair? Yes, and I want to put it down. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. To carry. There you go. Okay. Um, I'm going to walk through a couple of things because you and I, like um, back when I, I was in the middle of all this, those were my two, two of my main clinical stamps, okay? ADHD and OCD, okay? Um, and interestingly, I never, my anxiety was always an outflow of those things. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you use, and, and I, I, I'm speaking to you and I'm also talking to the audience. Okay. So you may say yeah. that's not me at all. This is what I'm saying, but okay. I'm, I'm speaking generally. If you use ADHD and OCD as excuses for not being a present or direct or connected spouse, your husband's going to have to go to war with ADHD and OCD. Yeah. Because some, pe- some people, um, when things are uncomfortable or they're ugly or they're not the way they should, should be, they go to war with reality. It's how a million people plus died of COVID. And you still have people saying, that's not real. That, that was that. Was the response sideways? Of course. Was there all the nonsense with vaccines and masks? Yes. But was COVID super real? Yes. Right? And Sure. A, a whole swath of our country didn't want to believe that. So they just went to war with reality. Yeah. If I'm married to someone who I love deeply and I've been with her for half of her life or more, and then she tells me there's this thing that keeps her from being on time, from paying attention to me, to being able to put her phone down, to staying connected, to want to be intimate, I have to go to war against those things because I can't go to war against her because I love her too much. Mm-hmm. And so it does injustice to. ADHD and OCD, it does injustice to the marriage, it does injustice to the per- people you love, and it does injustice to you to use those things as excuses. And so you've heard me say this a lot. Those are simply a context, not an excuse. Sure. They're just the, like, I wear sunglasses and the world looks dark. It's not dark. The sun's shining. I mean, I, it just looks darker to me, so I have to be okay with that. I have to just know that's just the way I see the world and experience the world. Mm-hmm. The second thing is when you have... 
OCD and ADHD especially, we often want to make a show of it. Okay, so here's an example in my house. I, stat, I check the locks three or four times before I go to bed. Mm. I could make a big announcement. I have for 30 years. I have forever. I could make a huge announcement. Well, my OCD is making me get up and go to, I just don't. I just say, hey, I'll be right back. Or I just say, I'm going to run to the basement real quick. And I'm pretty sure my wife knows what I'm doing, but maybe she has no idea. And maybe after all these yeah. years, she doesn't know. I'm not making an announcement about it. I'm just going along with the things that I got going on. Um, when my mind is looping and racing and I'm having the same conversation, the same fight, the same loop-de-loop-de-loop-de-loop, and I know you know what I'm talking about with that. Um, oh, yeah. I don't announce to the house, my OCD is real bad right now. I've taken ownership of it and say, um, I'm choosing to engage in these strange one-sided conversations that I would never have in real life. Right. And, and so I'm, I'm trying to communicate ownership, but I don't go around the house making proclamations about these things. Um, mm -hmm. Also, it's my responsibility. It's our responsibility. It's your responsibility. <laughs> whether therapy, exercise, and nutrition, whether medication, it's our responsibility to do the work way upstream so that the people we love and who interact with us aren't left trying to hold together the frayed edges of the tapestry of our relationship. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. So when you have OCD and ADHD, what are, what are a couple of things that drive your husband bananas? Um, I wouldn't say it really drives him crazy. I guess that I would say since my dad passed, I would describe it as like a flare up, like the anxiety. So he wants me to come to him and just say like, Tell me when you're feeling something because I was raised in a house where I wasn't hurt. So I internalize a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I'm at an age and a point in my marriage. We've been married almost seven years where I, it's like I'm just, it's like I'm my dad died and I didn't realize all these things before mm -hmm. that are not flaws in me necessarily, but just it's things like hiding. Like when I was little, I would physically hide a lot. Yep. Um, and now I've tried to describe to my husband, he's trying to figure out like, what's going, what's going on with you or why are you doing this? And I'm trying to explain to him, like, I feel like I'm hiding in different ways. Um, so what's a way, so you know that you, you know that you, you're someone who retreats. What is a way that yeah. you and him, that you can stop keeping secrets for someone with an ACEs score of a nine secrets will kill you. Yeah. And se um, secrets, will, and I'm thinking secrets, secret actions, secret crushes, secret thoughts, secret, hey, I had two more drinks last night than you know about, like secrets across the board. Um, yeah. And he's going to feel like, and, and again, in the same way that I would tell him if he was on the phone, don't tell her how to feel, right? I, he's going to feel like he is not enough of a husband He's not trustworthy enough. He's not safe enough for his wife to feel safe with him. Yes. And, and that's he's, mainly why I called in because he is so amazing. And he takes on the brunt of that. And it's me trying to explain to him, not using it as an excuse necessarily, but I want to undo these things as well. He's just seen me have points of really high success mm -hmm. before children. Like I went back to college as an older person. I had both my boys during finals weeks. I was a straight A student and it's like, then he's seen very low lows and he is trying to figure out what he can do. Well, you're, hold on, hold on. And you're, I'm like, you're the you daughter, can't do anything. you're the daughter of an, uh, of someone who struggled with addiction. You're a performer. Yes. You could, you yeah, could, oh, yep. <laughs> dude, you could pass your bar exam and give, have birth to a kid and probably finish the marathon you've been training for. You can perform. Yep. You can't be with. Because being What's with funny is my my dad and his whole entire family are literal musicians and performers and <laughs> yeah. actors and that's right. Yes. So you can perform all day and for someone like your husband, that performance looks like accomplishment. It's not for you. It's defense. Yeah. Yes. And it's so pretend that's right. And it drives me crazy. <laughs> well, you've got to stop declaring civil war with Sadie. Yeah. You don't have things to undo. 
You've got, when you talk about undoing, think about a knot in a rope and you're pulling so hard to try to undo that knot. Your job is to make peace. Open your hands up. There's a knot in the rope. We're moving on down the rope. We're moving on down. You cannot undo your, the abuse that happened to you as a kid. You can't unwind that. You can't unwind the things that your dad should have freaking said to you, to your, his baby girl that he never said. And the more energy you spend trying to unknot things that can't be undone, your, your, your kids, your husband, everybody sees you flexing and pulling and pulling and flexing and they don't know what it is. And so they're going to create stories that it's their fault. Yeah. Or that their mom's nuts. Yeah. And that's what hurts me because I do want to let go. Okay. I don't know how. And so let me tell you. There is one way, yeah. and it's the most annoying answer I could possibly give you. And as of someone who struggles in very similar areas as you, I hate to tell you this, okay? Okay. You have to, have to, have to come up with a way, a language between you and your husband that you can have some level of vulnerability. And it's going to be something that you have to practice. Yeah. Whether that's a spiral notebook that y'all share because you can't say it out loud. You're just going to, you're just going to write it down. Whether that's a weekly meeting that you have typed out that you hand him across a, a table and he reads it. And it could be everything from, I wanted to hide when you came home hot from work the other day. We've been having sex like this and I don't like it anymore. We haven't been having sex and I miss you. Is it me? Do you think I'm too ugly or am I too old or whatever? Whatever thoughts are going through it, you've got to figure out a way that you can safely practice bringing him into that conversation. Yeah. And my promise to you is it's going to feel like somebody, like you're standing naked on the, on a street corner. Like the, the whole, you're so exposed that every nerve in your body is going to tell you, cover up, cover up, cover up. Yeah. And you have to give him the opportunity to peacefully engage with you. And I'm going to tell you right now, he's going to say the wrong stuff. He's going to say stupid stuff. Oh, I know. We've been together long enough. I know that it's just hard for me because we have been together for since I was 15 years old mm -hmm. and he's the one person that I feel safe enough with. I don't think anybody has ever seen me. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's just been sort of hard to navigate yeah. how to do that. And he's the only person I feel safe enough to do that with. Okay. Your second responsibility you're going to have is to get a couple of girlfriends that you can begin practicing that with too. And it's going to, again, feel scary. Um, I, I had a couple of buddies about a decade ago, guys that we just drank beer and ate nachos and hung out all the time and watched fights. And I, I actually took the step. And again, these are guys I'd known for years. And so it wasn't super weird. It's not like I just met somebody. Um, but I told them, I've got to start getting some guys I can be honest around. And I think my yeah. marriage is falling apart. Or I think I'm not a good dad. And I think... And, they would give me their bro wisdom. Some of it was incredible. Some of it was just moronic. And that's that's fine. The important thing was not their wisdom, was not their uh, insights. The important thing was I said it out loud in a group mm -hmm. of people that I knew were still going to be right or die with me anyway. Yeah. Right? And so yeah. that's the healing. What you have to hear, here's, and here's the, for, for the, um, neuroscience nerds out there, here's what we're doing. We're teaching our body that the things that got us killed as a kid um, are the things that are going to keep, we're teaching our body that we're safe now. We weren't safe then. Your dad was not a safe place. Wherever mom happened to be was not safe. The person who sexually abused you was not safe. Your husband is. Yes. These two women are. And what we're going to do is we're going to practice setting these things down. And when you feel yourself taking them up, we're just going to write that down. I'm going to write that down. And husband, here's the deal. I'm going to practice saying things to you. And honestly, if you want to have him give me a call, I'd love to talk to him because I know it's hard on his side too. Oh, yeah. I'd love to talk I to him. I can't imagine. Yeah. Um, no, but, he will. He'd definitely love to call in. Okay. We are a big fan of Dave and you and yeah. Uh, uh, have him give me a call. Um, he's going to have to work really hard to not take all this personally. Yeah. Because every and time you his, hold a secret, he, he does. I know he does. Yeah. I know. I know. 
every time you hold a secret in, he blames himself for not being a, a husband enough or yeah. um, for not being creating a safe enough space, right? And so he's going to have to also have the courage while you're saying your needs, he's got to say his too. Yes. And you're going to have to hear those as well, right? Yep. OCD and um, OCD and anxiety. These things have a way of making your needs the only needs in town. And it's a lie because one of the great, the great way paths out of this is um, one of the great paths out is serving other people, helping other people meet their needs. And when someone starts putting needs, your first thoughts are, well, what about me? What about me? That's just the, that's just your racing mind talking. It's nonsense. Great gift can be, let me help you meet your needs. Um, but again, whew, I want to practice this. I want you all to practice, 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 figure it out, practice. Um, whether let's, we're going to put a breakfast on the calendar. We're going to put a lunch on the calendar. I'm going to put a spiral notebook on your pillow and you put it back on my pillow. I'm just going to write some of these things down, or I can just tell you 15 minutes at night before we go to bed or, or when we wake up in the morning, I'm going to tell you these things and they're going to come in waves. And there's going to be some days when everything's wonderful. There's going to be waves that come through and everything is a disaster. Um, but let me say this and, and um, I hope this finds its way into your heart a little bit. Your dad wasn't well. Your dad was sick. Your dad struggled hard. And I think at the end, your dad loved his little girl. And as long as you live, you'll never understand the demons he was fighting. Those that told him the only way to get through today is, is more pills. Whew. Open your hands to that. Before you go to bed tonight, I want you to write a letter in a notebook with a pen to seven-year-old Sadie until you're sorry you've been blaming her for so much and you've been giving her so much to carry and it's time for her to go play with her friends like seven-year-olds are supposed to do. And I want you to tell that seven-year-old Sadie that you love her, that dad loved her. <sighs> it's time for her to stop defending you. I'll be with you every step of the way, Sadie. Thanks for your call. Hang on the line. I'm going to send you a copy of Own Your Past, Change Your Future. You may already have it, but I'm going to send you a copy of it anyway, and you and your husband can read it together. Um, we can start this new journey of practicing teaching our body. You weren't okay then. <sighs> We're okay now. We'll be right back. Hey, Deloney here. Folks, getting out of debt and getting good sleep have something in common. Intentionality. When you're working your way out of debt, you have to be purposeful. You got to build your emergency fund, pay off your debt smallest to largest and stick with it, all that stuff. And when you're ready to invest in good sleep, you have to have a plan too. You got to get that early morning sunlight. You got to exercise. You got to cut out all this caffeine and you got to limit screen time. And you have to budget for a premium quality mattress because it makes an enormous difference. And that's why I recommend DreamCloud mattresses. And for my friends on a budget, I have incredible news. Right now, DreamCloud is offering my listeners 25% off their order, plus $50 in additional savings. And why not? $599 more in accessories with promo code John Deloney. That's pillows, luxury sheets, and a mattress protector. And DreamCloud gives you a one-year in-home trial so you can make sure it's the right fit. So it's time to invest in good sleep. Have a budget meeting with your spouse, make a plan, and then go to dreamcloudsleep.com and use code John Deloney to get your new mattress today. That's dreamcloudsleep.com and use code John Deloney. All right, we are back. We're going to go out to Chris in Mexico City. Come on, Stas, Chris. What are we doing? Hey, Dr. John. How are you? I am doing, doing great, man. How are you? Doing good. Doing good. Fantastic, man. So what's up? Calling in from Mexico City. What's up, dude? Yeah, absolutely. So um, me and my wife have been married for just a short time now. How long? Um, so about six months. Okay. Yep. So... I'm American. She's Mexican. Okay. Um, so we, we did it for a while. We got married. Um, I moved here so that immigration could be um, faster. Okay. Um, and because it was just taking a long time. So after that, we're here and immigration is actually going a lot quicker than we expected. So when you got and, married, was the plan always y'all were going to live in the States? Yeah. 
Okay. Um, how old is yeah, she? So we, we did basically from day one. How old she is she? She is 20. 20. How old are you? 21. 21. Where'd y'all meet? Uh, we just met online. We just met online. Where was your first, where was your first meet up? Uh, in Mexico. Okay. So you met her online. Y'all had a couple of times together. Did you move down before you were married or did y'all get married and then move down? Uh, so I moved down maybe a couple of weeks before, but not really. We weren't like, I mean, I was living together, but like in separate rooms and stuff. Uh, okay. So, um, cool. So how long have y'all lived in Mexico together now? Um, about, yeah, basically six months. Okay. Basically. And you guys thought it was going to be a couple of years and all of a sudden it's like, oh, it's time to go. Yeah, well, maybe a year or a year and a half. Yeah. And so now we're kind of like, oh, what the heck? And, and she really struggles with it because she's really close with her family. Yeah, absolutely. And, like she even like, she'll get emotional if like she doesn't, doesn't see him for like a week or like maybe five days. Yeah. She'll start like crying and, and just be really sad. I want to see him again. So I kind of knew this day was always coming. Like, like it would be, it would be really hard, but now it's kind of sooner and I like don't know how to support her. I think first getting out of your head that this is going to be a day. Yeah. This is going to be a long, long, long time. Okay. Yeah. She's going to be grieving a, the, her family, her culture, the language, the food, the smells, the, the, the trap I mean, everything about her life is about to change. And she's 20. She's still a kid. Yeah. And, um, what I would tell you is you can't be upset that she's feeling drawing, drawn to her family over this new life that she had imagined and now suddenly staring her in the face, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I would honor that distress and that, um, that apprehension. It's very real, very yeah. true. And if she's, she's going to be very, very sad. She's going to have periods of grief, deep grief. She's going to go through periods of her feelings are going to be highly depressed. Um, that's going to happen and it's going to happen for a season. And so I think settling into, that's going to be really tough. My wife, to be with me, she's giving up everything. And so, like, do you get the humility there? I mean, that's just such a massive thing she's giving up all of her life, everything she knows for this dude she met. And so her body's screaming at her, don't do this, right? So I, I guess there's a making peace with it. It just is, right? And she's not bad. Yeah. She's not broken. She's not dysfunctional. You're not bad. You're not broken. This is just a tough situation for two young, two young star-crossed lovers, right? Yeah. Um, do y'all have a moving date yet? Nope. We are still in the end processes of the immigration. So it's not, it's not done. It's just, it's just coming. When you say that, are you talking 30 days, 90 days, six months? What do probably you think? Probably about, probably about 90 days. Yeah. Okay. 90 days to four, maybe four months. I don't know. Um, question number one is I would have a steady, repeated conversation with her probably every morning. Mm -hmm. It starts something like, how can I best love you today? Yeah. I have that conversation and okay. it, it might change day to day to day. Like I need you near me and I need to hold you right now. Can we do that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I need yeah. you to get out of the house and not look at my face. Cool. Like, right. You're going to think, oh, I thought in the mornings we hugged today is not going to be that day. Right. Um, yeah. the grief is going to, it's going to be like waves in the ocean. It's going to be some real low valleys, real high peaks, and it's going to be disorienting for you. Like being on a boat out in the ocean, it's going to feel disorienting. Um, yeah. just, just know that's coming that way. Um, I would give her a, figure out a safe, a place to have a, a safe discussions about some very concrete plans. Mm-hmm. We're going to move on this date. Let's go ahead and put one on the calendar. What do you want to do in the 90 days between now and when we are heading out? What do you want to do in the 70 mm -hmm. days between now? You see what I'm saying? Yeah. I want to see if we can put that date on the calendar. Even if it's going to move, let's go ahead and put it on the calendar. And if it moves, great. Cool. Yeah. Um, Just so it's like kind of real. That That's what we're doing. We're trying to make it very, very real. Right now it's still... Yeah. Um, Anxiety operates in a fantasy in this futuristic could happen, could happen, it's going to happen, might happen. Let's put some things down. And the body has a remarkable way of responding when things are imminent. Mm -hmm. Like you hear people super anxious about flying, anxious about flying, anxious about flying. 
Um, and then you hear people who survive a plane, like planes going down. They don't say they were anxious. They don't say they were terrified. They say they were really sad. Like the body, like, oh, this is happening. And then there's, there's just ways the body takes care of itself in, in a pretty remarkable way. Let's see about putting something on the calendar. And I would not do that and say, this is when we're going. I would invite her into that conversation. Yeah. Um, dates, times. On this day, what time would you want to leave? Would you want to leave before breakfast or after breakfast? Mm -hmm. Would you want to leave after dinner, before dinner? Um, what do you want the night before to be, to look like? You want to have a big party? You want to like, let's start making some very concrete re uh, reality. And I want you to hold some very open handed space for her looking at you saying, I can't do this. Have you thought through that? Yeah. Um, yeah, I have a little bit. Yeah. What happens when that happens? It's kind of scary to me. <laughs> I mean, the same thing, same thing that she'd be, she's going through, I'd be going through at the same time. So. What's the likelihood? Give me a, a percentage out of a hundred that she says, I, I, I thought I could make the move, but I can't. Um, I don't know, like 10, 20%. Okay. So not a lot. No, I, I think she'll go, but like, I can't, I'm not a hundred percent sure. You know, that's gotta be scary. And that's for kind you. of scary to me. Cause I, I know I listen to your show a lot, so I know that she can change her mind. And that's what we discussed from day one and stuff. It's just, it's also hard on me. Yeah. Um, you are probably going to feel a lot of guilt and shame that you're taking her away from all this stuff to go live this other life. Is it, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, I would do my best to not hold on to that, to feel it, to notice that it's there. Oh, I'm feeling guilty right now. We both as, yeah. as young adults agreed on this. And so, um, I'm not gonna, I, I, I'm not gonna hold shame over this. I, I, I might feel yeah. guilty. My body's going to do what it's going to do, but we're going to go do the next right thing. Um, yeah. is there some things that y'all can talk through about what would make landing in the States more, um, hospitable, more of a safe, a soft landing, if you will. Like the actual day or like, like just things in place. I'm talking about month one, month two, month three, uh -huh. those who I've talked to who, yeah. who move straight from mom's home, dad's home to the States. It's so disorienting. What we call yeah. normal life is so insane. From the pace and the speed yep. and the volume and the sound, everything is madness. Um, yeah. Have y'all talked about well, a way that to, soft land? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely want to like surround her with other people, yeah. um, other other Mexican people especially, um, so that she can feel a little bit at home, um, and so that she like doesn't feel so disoriented. Like she can still be like. The supermarket, the Mexican supermarket down the street or whatever. Supermercado. So, like, <laughs> yeah. But hold on. I and would do all that. Let, let me tell you this. Um, I think it's very important for you to invite her into this conversation. And as a white American to not try to curate her experience. Okay. Because she may come over here and say, hey, the more time I spend at this supermarket or in this thing, I, I can't breathe because all I can think about is my family. I need to spend a season <laughs> just going to Kroger. Yeah. Right? Um, and it may be, no, 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 These things give me, um, they, they let me exhale when I go into. So yeah. I would invite her to, maybe you sit down and say some of the questions, some of the things you were thinking. Hey, I was thinking if we took salsa dancing lessons or if we ate at such and such restaurant or if you, we went to a Hispanic serving church or whatever, um, that yeah. you would feel more at home, but that's just me trying to put stuff on you. What do you think? What you, what do you uh, think's okay. going to land? Right. And you may be all prepped, ready to go. And then she goes once and she's like, no, nah, I'm not ever doing that again. Right. And I think it's just holding it with a really open hand there. Can you do that? So, yeah, for sure. Cool. So the soft landing would be, me not trying to curate her experience more of just her, um, her being in the conversation. How are we going to do this? Yeah. I think it's, um, here's some, here is some questions. Here is some opportunities. Um, and maybe even, um, maybe even asking the question, how, how I can work really hard. Like I want to love you as best I can. Would love look like me trying to find as many opportunities for you to be both uh, culinary, cultural, um, education? Like, do you want do you want to try to recreate home here? Because I'll work my butt mm -hmm. off to try to make that happen. 
I'll find the, yeah. the restaurants, the, the supermarkets, the cultural events. I'll, I'll do whatever we can. Or yeah. do you want to um, just close that door for a season? That door will open at some point, make no mistake. But I want to close that door for a season. I want to jump in both feet and try to figure out how Publix works and why y'all are driving on that side of the road. I want to try to figure out all that stuff. Um, and yeah. so, and just inviting her in, but, but with an eagerness to, I want to help this, you navigate this experience the, as best as humanly possible. And I'm open to all of it. You see the, the difference there being, she's not moving into another dad who's just going to make her do some things. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Exactly. It's very much a spirit. And she may say, I don't care. You do, you, you've been there. You do what's best. You tell me. Awesome. Say, okay, cool. I'm going to do this. And then in two weeks, we're checking back in. I want you to tell me everything you didn't like about it. Everything you did like about it. What made you, gave you peace. What made you feel anxious. Let's, let's check back in. And I think your tendency is probably going to be to try to own all of it. You can't, you got to invite her in. And, um, Man, I wish you guys the best. I hope the transition is going to be rocky. It's going to be tough. It's going to be full of tears. It's going to be full of heartbreak. But man, I hope uh, hope it goes well. I think is the more you keep your hands open and the more you invite her in to be a part of what happens next, that's the best chance your, your relationship has. And by the way, for everybody listening, this is for every move, every job transition, every new kid that comes along, sitting down and saying, how can I best love you in this new season? And hang on, because that season's going to change again, and that season's going to change again. How can I best love you in this new season? And invite each other into that conversation. Don't just start dictating. That is the road to transforming your marriage. We'll be right back. Hey, good folks. John Deloney here. I feel like I fell through a glitch in the Matrix. This is my job. I get to have this show, do this show, walk alongside each one of you as a career. This is what I do, and I have a blast doing it. And me and the team, we're so thankful for all of you for being a part of our show. Whether you're one of the original 17 or you're one of the millions that's come since then, we are so grateful for you, and we want to put together the best possible show that we can. So if you're one of the originals or if you're brand new, we want your feedback. Tell us what you love about the show, what you hate about the show, what you'd like to see more of, what you'd like to hear more of, and what you want us to never do again. You can email us at askjohn at ramseysolutions.com. That's askjohn at ramseysolutions.com with your feedback. Thank you for being such an important part of the show. Rock on. All right. All right. Hey, uh, Jenna, Kelly's not here today, so that means we can go crazy. I still want my job. Can't go too crazy. Ugh, fun ruiner. All right. Let's go to Be- let's go to Kansas, literally. Let's go to Bethany out in Kansas. What's up, Bethany? Hi, Dr. John. How are you doing? Partying, dude. How are you? I'm good. Just chilling out in the cold weather here in Kansas. <laughs> How cold is it today? Well, it says 40, but it's been cloudy and just gloomy and rainy for several days now. So Ugh, That just sounds... Gross. Yeah. It's been that way here in Nashville and the sun came out today. So hang in there. It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> open. Open. So what's up? How can I help? Um, so my question for you today is um really just so I'm only in my second long term relationship and um I just you know, I gain a lot of advice from everybody around me. Um, but now I'm getting <laughs> it's always terrible, <laughs> Bethany. You know that. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm hoping most of it's good, but um, it is. I guarantee you, it's not the. It's not. It's the worst. <laughs> How old are you? I am 36. Okay, you just said the way you said this is my second long term relationship. You said it as though something's wrong with you. Do you think that? You know, I've questioned that through the years. Why? But, um, uh, because I'm, you know, in my mid 30s and. I just had my first long-term relationship when I was 34, so I was just kind of... What like, happened with that I one? Know. Huh? What happened with that one? Uh, he wasn't ready to be an adult yet. Uh, How old was he? 33. Jeez. So, he was looking... I, I just... By the end of it, I was just feeling more like his mom than God. anything. Good so. for you. Gross. Don't kiss your son. Yuck. 
Good. Yeah, it was it was not great. All right, but- a quick aside. Men, grow up. Okay, now we're back, Bethany. Jeez, thirty three. <laughs> Unbelievable. Right, right. Okay, yeah, so have you met somebody with, new? Yes, and Ew, he's gross. He's wonderful. Oh, um, gross. Okay. <laughs> Why? Yeah. What makes him wonderful? Um, he's a grown-up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no. No, he has a really good heart for people. Um, we align on a lot of things um that are very like core values for for me and okay. for him. And uh, we've done a lot of talking, the serious talks, um, and we've been together for six months and we're starting to talk, not really even starting. We've, you know, talked about future and what all that looks like. So my question really is like, how do you know really when you're ready to ride or die, as you say, with somebody and um, like best practices to prepare for like marriage? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, the very un-Hollywood truthful answer is when I decide from this day forward, I'm going to wake up every day and choose to love this person. I wish there was like this, like when they cross this magic threshold and people will tell you all kind of stupid things that they've got on posters in their church office or stitched into some pillow at the grandma's house, whatever. <laughs> love is a decision. It's a choice that I make every day, sometimes multiple times a day. And mm-hmm. my wife makes it sometimes minute by minute, right? <laughs> um, so it's it's really when you say, it, I'm parking the bike here for the ride or die analogy. I'm parking the bike here. And this is where I'm going to be. And so that leads me to the next. There's a couple of questions that I always like. And they're a little, they're a little untraditional. They, they wrap up some of the stuff that you would hear in normal, normal, like, is he the one or is all, all that kind of stuff? Um, mm-hmm. The first question I always want to know from a couple is where do y'all go in times of disconnection or distress? Here's why. Like from each other? From life. Are you somebody who, when there's an awkward conversation at work, you disappear? Do you get loud and start swinging? Do you freeze and just freeze up? Um, does it happen in a romantic relationship? Does it happen with kids? Does it happen with the person at the grocery store? Here's why. We often try to solve the fighting or the hiding or the yelling, and we don't realize that it's the exact same core issue. It's just your your body does one thing and my body does another. And so what you often get in a relationship, a, a, a romantic relationship, is there's a, an issue. The issue is you came home and said, hey, we were going to talk about the budget and there's a $400 expense at some ammo store. Not that that's ever happened in my life. And (laughs) and instantly, you have a a, a defensive mechanism that just kicks in. Maybe it's fighting. Maybe it's getting really loud and pissed off. Maybe it's hiding. It is, Mm -hmm. I'm just not going to bring this up. I'm not going to say anything and I'm going to let the slow ash of resentment burn. He, on the other hand, when you bring it up, gets real defensive. This is my money. I work hard and and he's going to get... I want to know where each of us go during times of disconnection and distress. And here's the the key here is when my wife, I I am somebody who I I, kind of toggle, which is weird. It's rare. Um, Sometimes I, I, my chest comes up and I start to start to fight. And sometimes I hide my wife. She pulls away. That's just, that's just the way it goes. Now I know when she starts to pull away, her body's telling her she's not safe. It's mm-hmm. not because she's got some character issue or some flaw. It's that her body's trying to protect her. And I can then go to the mirror and say, what am I bringing to this that makes the house feel unsafe? See what I'm saying? Usually it's I'm being reckless with spending or I'm, I've got bowl. I walk in with bags of gummy candy and she just knows, oh no, he's about to fall off the wall. All right. So <laughs> it's, it, that's, that's question number one. Question number two is how do you tell, how, how, Asking each other, how do you like to hear things that you probably don't want to know? Okay. And this ranges from, hey, you have a booger in your nose. Do you want me to make a joke about it? Do you want me to say it very discreetly? Do you want to just not know? To here's how many people I've slept with. To here's how many people um, I don't I don't like it. Like when we're having sex, I don't like it when you do this versus when you do that. Like 
How do you want to hear things that are going to be hard to hear? The way you talked to me last night when you were mad makes me want to leave this house. How do you want to hear those things? And let's try to do our best to, can I honor that? If somebody says, I don't ever want you to tell me, I don't ever want to know. You might say, I'm going to tell you. So this, this might not be a great relationship. Um, <laughs> or like my instinct is to make jokes about things. That's just how I handle uh, hard situations. That's really helpful when I'm going into a crisis situation and somebody's passed away and there's really hard things to see. And then we can make a, a really dark black humor joke and all of us can kind of like giggle through it, right? Um, mm -hmm. I learned early on, my wife didn't like me going, oh, you know what I would love to do right now? Kiss you, except you got a booger on your face. Like she didn't, that, that, that hurt her feelings. That, that, was, that wasn't cool. What she would like me to say is to whisper into your, hey, you got a booger right there. Just be really matter of fact and direct, facts of your friends, just say it and then we move on. I had to learn that new language, right? But when she said, can you do it like this? I was like, absolutely, I can do that. That wasn't a big deal to me, okay? So how do you tell each other things you probably don't want to hear? That's number two. Number three, the, the big ones, the role of religion, money, and sex in, the, in their, our, our relationship. How do you deal with those personally? How are we going to do those things here? Um, and here's the big one. How do you, each of you respond when those things change? Not if, but when. My relationship with faith is very, very different today than it was when I started dating my wife. Drastically mm -hmm. different. There's been seasons of me being a devout atheist, like just almost prof I'm like proselytizing. And there's been seasons when I'm so in tune with my faith and belief that um, it's hard. There's, there's not a lot of space for anybody else. And my wife has been through ups and downs in her particular journeys. We've just, we all chose at the beginning to hold those things really loosely. It's not my job to make sure she believes everything I believe, but that works for us. Some people couldn't do that, right? And so what's the mm -hmm. role of religion? What's the role of money? For me, money is very, very scary. For my wife, it's this amazing opportunity. And so we respond to it differently. We spend differently. We save differently. So what's the role it plays? Same with sex. Um, and so you see what I'm saying? The ro what's the role of religion, money, and sex? And then here's the last one. What's the role of kids and extended family? This has, has um, this guy that's just so wonderful. Gross, Bethany. Um, has he, uh, has he been married before? Yeah, he, that was kind of like a side question too that I had. Um, but cause he has a 23 year old daughter. Um, and she, <laughs> Like how, like, I know I don't really have a say <laughs> in their relationship, <laughs> but as we do oh come to this like situation, she does depend on him financially mm -hmm. quite a bit. Um, she's kind of got her and her grandpa, like sort of wrapped around her finger in that. And, uh, I'm, <sighs> and I'm looking at the future of like, you know, if we extend the family, expand the family, like how, how do we have that conversation? How do I have that conversation? Or I don't know. That conversation sounds less about he can't afford it or less about there's things we want to do together for our dreams, but he's still paying for an adult. And it sounds more like, I know that grubby little girl. I've, I've seen her before and she's just taking this man's money. It sounds much more personal than financial. Yeah. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> uh, Bethany, you're my favorite call I've had in a while. Um, so that's going to be a you know. issue, not him. Where okay. it's going to be a him issue is if you find yourself quietly low simmer, disrespecting him because he's still paying for her. Right. If you have a hard time with the way that he, if you think you're going to gently steer him away from his daughter, you're not going to. You're going to, you're going to cause havoc. Yeah. And um, I don't, I don't want to do that. I know you don't. I like, know you don't. I know you don't, but you also want her to grow up. I've seen girls like her. Like you want that too. Um, yeah. I think that's, that's going to be a place where probably bite your tongue on that one, where it will come up is when you start to say, okay, well, when we have this conversation about the role of religion, the role of money, the role of sex, that's really a role of what kind of life do we want to live? And in 20 years, when you're 56 and you're 58, what house do you want to have? What town do you want to live in? Where do you want to be? And there's no guarantee we're ever going to get there, but at least let's le at least aim at something and begin formulating a plan. Let's reverse engineer a plan to get there. 
And that's when it's like, hey, you still send a thousand dollars a month to your 23 year old kid. That's a lot. Tell me about that. And it's probably going to be he feels guilty over some divorce and he still feels like he needs to fund this thing because he's paying this out of guilt. And that happens all the time. And he's going to have to come to the choice that he doesn't want to do that. Yeah. Yeah. There's, hey. I, I feel like there's a lot of guilt in it. Of course. Uh, there almost always yeah. is. Almost always is. And, but he's a good dad. Like he raised her, so of course, he's of course. A good dad. <laughs> um, there's also, um, have you taken her out for coffee just to get to know her? Um, not one on one, not yet. It's still been kind of a get to know her with with him around, and so <laughs> she hasn't. Is your dad still around? That huh? Is your dad still around? Yeah. Are okay. you fully I'm you not. around your dad and and your boyfriend? No, <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not. Uh, my father-in-law is in town and I wore a long sleeve shirt just to cover up my tattoos. And it's my house in my house. <laughs> just out of respect. Just trying to be respectful. And so, um, <laughs> I tell you that to tell you, you're not getting to know her with her dad around. Right. You're getting to see how she, wh- how she curates her image when old man's around, but you don't know her. Um, right. I, I, I would, I would lean in there because you're going to find a lot about her. Um, you're going to find some stories about him that you don't know. Um, you're going to find out a lot about how she's been raised, how she's operated and for both really good. And you're, you're going to have some like, Whoa, I didn't know all that. And that's part of the picture that you are choosing to opt into if you're with this guy. And I think that's, I think that's amazing. It's just, you you just want to make sure the, the car looks great. I just want to drive it first. Yeah. And what role does your family play? Well, they're three hours away, so <laughs> they're just kind of their advisors <laughs> a lot of the time. <laughs> but I'm talking about Christmas, Thanksgiving, holidays, oh, birthdays, yeah. funerals. Yeah, those are important to us, and and that's the that's the difference in our my family versus his. Is like it's not really a, a thing with his family because it's so he has such a small family. Um, but for my family, like. It's a big thing. Let's have all those conversations up. What's the role yeah. of kids in extended family? Yeah. That is important. Does that sound good? Yeah. Hey, I'm proud of you for Thanks. asking these fun, hard questions. Well, thank you for allowing me to ask these fun, hard questions. <laughs> it's, your, it's your life. You can do whatever you want. I here, Here's the one thing I would challenge you and him on. I would create a spirit of adventure. When you're asking these questions, not a spirit of law and order SVU inquiry in court. What's, how do you believe, how do you function with religion? What is your thoughts on sex? That's all like, geez, I now I got to fight you. Now my defense mechanisms are coming up. But if we're going on an adventure together, Hey, we're thinking about building a life. What's the role of faith and religion plays in your world? Um, is this scientific method something you worship or is it a cool way to solve science problems? Like, like, tell me about what you believe. Tell me about what you think. What's the role of money plays in your life? Did you have a lot growing up? Did you have none growing up? Like, let's let's have a spirit of adventure about these questions. And by the way, every one of these questions will change. Ta-da, that's the big secret. Nobody tells you about. They'll all change. And so the second question here is probably one of the most important ones. How do I tell you things that you probably don't want to hear? You don't want to know that I used to love it when you did this thing in bed and then four months went by and I hate it and now you think it's the greatest move it's your best move that makes me want to not be around you at all how do you want me to tell you that because you're going to feel embarrassed that for four months you've been coming in and doing this thing how how do we have those conversations because it's going to shift and it's going to shift and it's going to move and that is the grand adventure of being married to somebody and it's not something to be scared over to run away from it's something to embrace fully and be like oh awesome I get to have a never ending adventure with somebody it's fantastic. What a what a rad way to live. It's awesome. Hey, hang on the line, Bethany. I'm going to send you the questions for humans, for dating couples, and for romantic couples. Gross. And um, those are going to be on me. I want you all to go through them. You'll have a blast. Hey, thanks for the call. We'll be right back. It seems so easy, but most of us way undervalue real, genuine relationships. Our friendships, our marriages, we don't know what we're doing. And instead of diving into the mess, we accept shallowness and distraction and we wallpaper over our loneliness. 
So let me say this boldly. You cannot be well alone. You've got to get connected to real life people and have deep, powerful relationships. I'm talking about relationships where you can be honest, where you can open up, where you can share hard things, and you each know that you'll still show up for each other. And in my new book, Own Your Past, Change Your Future, we'll walk through a not-so-complicated approach to relationships, mental health, and wellness, and getting connected is a key part of that. That's why you'll learn shallowness and loneliness are so dangerous, and more importantly, you'll learn how to create meaningful relationships in your life moving forward. There is no good app to help adults find friendships, but this book can help. Go to johndeloney.com to take the next step towards wellness. That's Own Your Past, Change Your Future at johndeloney.com. All right, we are back. Hey, this it, and it's celebration time. My book, Own Your Past, Change Your Future, is having its one-year anniversary today. Thousands of lives have been changed. People have been picking this book up all across the world, and I'm so grateful. This book is my way of sitting with you one-on-one. Just us and some nachos, right? And talking through life, offering practical advice and encouraging you on topics like relationships, trauma, why the world's gone sideways, and most importantly, what what do we do about it, right? In celebration of the one-year anniversary of the book, I want to give you the Own Your Past, Change Your Future audiobook, ebook, and my key talk. This is the genesis of the book, Uh, a talk I gave to about 3,000 business leaders. I think we were in Orlando. And it, it touched a nerve in a way that I, I did not anticipate. And it ended up being the genesis of the book. I'm going to give you a copy of that talk for free when you buy a hardcover copy of Own Your Past, Change Your Future. This deal is for today only. It ends at 11.59 p.m. Central Time. All right? So today only, I'm going to give you all that stuff if you pick up a copy. If you are one of the people who haven't picked it up yet, this is the perfect time. If you're going to buy for Christmas or for the holidays, whatever, this is the moment, okay? This book is not just for people healing from trauma. This is for everybody. I've heard from single moms. I've heard from multi, 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 multi millionaires. I've heard from police officers. I've heard from veterans. I've heard from everybody in between. Everybody who's looking around the world going, what in the world is going on? So get your copy and all these freebies today before the deal ends at midnight. Go to johndeloney.com slash deal, D-E-A-L johndeloney.com slash deal. And in honor of the caller from Kansas and my brothers and sisters from the K-State, song is from the great Kansas. Carry on, wayward son. It goes like this. Carry on, my wayward son. There will be peace when you're done. Lay your weary head to rest. Don't you cry no more. Kelly, that's what you always tell me. Don't cry no more. Once I rose above the noise and confusion just to get a glimpse beyond this illusion. I was soaring even higher, but I flew too high. Kelly gets too high. Though my eyes could see, I was still a blind man. Though my mind could think, I was still a madman. I hear the voices when I'm dreaming. I can hear them say, carry on, my wayward son. I tell you all, keep taking the next step. Stay on the path. You got this. We'll see you soon. We'll see you soon.